Okay. Yeah. Okay, it is Wednesday, June 5th. We are moving right along both in our calendar month and in our book of Revelation. We have come a long ways. We will be picking up today in chapter 20 and verse 12. We're in the middle of verse 12. Uh, and I see, I thought we were set up, but I see we're not in this one. And, okay, I'll go with this one then. Um, so that we can review and get our minds fresh. Remember, we've had the blessing of leaving the tribulation behind. We had the millennial kingdom. We even have gotten past Gog and Magog. And we're pushing on into this part where we're, we've been beginning to talk. Uh, well, I think we've pretty much covered the great white throne judgment. I'll review that quickly. And we're looking into what comes in eternity future from there. Uh, actually, we're in the great white throne judgment. I don't know why I said we were through. It started in verse 11, so that is where we are. So that's where I'll start the review. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And so as we just review quickly, we remember that uh, the great white throne is not the judgment that believers will ever stand before, that they do not stand before God in judgment. Uh, for their works, that this is what it's talking about. Great is, 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 is God's throne is infinite. He is all power. The finite will stand before him. It is white, showing pure, holy justice is being served. The righteousness coming from the throne. The throne showing authority and majesty. And uh, we saw that, that anyone who is standing here are the unsaved throughout time. We look at our line down below, we know that they've gone all the way through time from the first death all the way through to this point now. Any who died unbelieving, that's who we're talking about. We're not looking at believers, we're not looking at our judgment, which was not for uh, salvation. Our judgment was for reward or loss of reward. We saw our judgment took place in heaven. You can't be in heaven if you had not been saved prior to standing before the Lord. And again, you're standing before for rewards. We saw that we come back and we'll reign with him. We saw all of that. But now we are seeing that these are standing before the presence of the Lord. We talked last week, so I won't go into the detail, but how they're in essence sus suspended in space because we've just read heaven and earth have fled away. No place was found for them. The heaven we know, the earth we know, is not in existence in the way that we know it now at this point in time. But when you're outside of gravity, we know that, that we've got space station, we've got astronauts who've gone into space, and yet God doesn't need to tether them. <laughs> he doesn't need a space station. But in essence, he sets up like a space station because he sets up a throne and a place for judgment. In my little puny mind, I just have in, in my mind's eye a line waiting for their turn in judgment. Exactly how that will be, I don't know. Because I, I am just trying to do heavenly on earthly terms. But what I do know is what's going to happen there. And that is that, uh, and Yohanan John saw it, he said in verse 12, I saw the dead, the great and the small standing before the throne. The idea behind great and small is it doesn't matter whether they were a big person in this life or a little person, and I'm not talking about stature, but that stature doesn't matter either. Male, female, rich, poor, nothing matters. They, what matters is the one criteria that put them there is they refused, they rejected the plan of salvation. They rejected the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So there are books that are, that are being opened, and I believe that's where we left off pretty much, so I'll start right there with the book of life. I think it says first... Well, I'll read it. The, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds, according to their works. Okay, let's go back and divide that up. I'm going to take you just real quickly to Revelation. <coughs> excuse me. Revelation 3 and verse 5. And this is in the time when the message was going out to the different churches. Um, and in 3, 5, we have, uh, he's speaking to Sardis. We know that from verse 4. He's telling Sardis that he, he had some good to say and some other for them. But in verse 5, he says, he who wins a victory will, like them, be dressed in white clothing. We know that white clothing is reward, the white righteous robe of 
of the Lord that he did clothe, he clothes, he puts on us. <laughs> he presses us up. He makes us beautiful because we're in his clothing. And, well, it even says that I should have just read it and not tried to say it. And they will walk with me clothed in white because they are worthy. That was, was verse 4. So there, verse 5, he who wins victory will like them be dressed in white clothing, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So we, this is something we're familiar with. We've heard about the book of life before. And he goes on and says, in fact, I will actually acknowledge him individually before my father and before his angels. So those who have their names written in the book of life are acknowledged before God the Father, before the angels, before anyone else who is in that presence at that time. They are acknowledged as having their name written in the book of life. So here's our flip side because in chapter 20 and verse 12, the book of life is open. But what we're going to see is it's open to prove that their names are not in the book of life. That's the problem. That's what put them there. Messiah is the one in control of the books. He is the judge. Remember, uh, God made it clear that he gave to Messiah the right to judge because Messiah took on human form, lived our life here on this earth, and as the perfect man has the right to judge man who is not perfect, uh, which is everyone without Messiah in their hearts. So the books are open to show, to prove that their name is not there. They are not open for... Uh, Oh, what's the word I want? Um, for, dis not discussion, but that will work. They, they can't do anything to get their name written in the book now, is what I'm trying to say. They, yes, it's not open for, that word I can't think of. <laughs> um, debate. Debate, thank you, thank you. It's not open for debate, it's open for proof, to show that the name is not there. Uh, they can plead, they can plead all they want, and I imagine that's what each one is going to do. They're going to plead on the basis of, well, I did this, I did that, I lived a great life, I saved that person, I helped this one. They'll start listing all the things that they feel that made them a good person, but we know that there's no criteria that good is good enough. Holy, perfect is the only standard. If you are 100% perfect every day of your life, never do anything wrong, then you have an argument with the Lord. But we all know no one can live that kind of life. That in our humanity, born with a sin nature, we don't even make it into the time when we can talk before we've already done things that are not right. It doesn't take long to see the honoriness in a little one. Yeah. That <laughs> you may not be able to say a whole lot, but that word mind that you certainly have discovered. And that little temper tantrum is already there and so forth and so on. So, even if they plead that they were faithful, they were good, they're going, it's going to be shown that they were not. And we'll talk about how that is as we go on. Let me just also say that, uh, notice that the, the book of life is separate. The books were open, books plural. Another book was open, which is the book of life. So you have, I, I'm going to just say the book of life sitting on the right, and then you have the other books sitting on the left. Now, I'm not telling you it's right and left. I'm just saying this to help us understand because the scripture doesn't say that the idea is that these are plural and this is singular. In one book of life, there is only one book. That's the book that matters for our salvation. Now, the plural, the, what's written in the books, is going to be their works. It is going to be what they're going to be judged for. Because again, as we've said before, not everyone deserves the same amount of of uh, consequences to their actions. Someone who has lived a good life, who has tried to be a good person, does not deserve the same sort of punishment that one who has been evil, who has taken the lives of many, who has just been a terror on this earth. We, you know who I'm talking about, deserves the judgment according to their deeds. Now, do we see that scripturally? Because that's us talking, we're very quick to say, we want righteousness. We want justice. We want it to be fair. What do we see in Scripture? Well, let's look and see if we see degrees of punishment from Scripture. Okay? Go with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And in Luke chapter 12, we will start with verse 46. Where we read... 
And we're jumping into a parable that's been given that I think we can jump in. If I see I have to explain more, I'll go back and do it. But it simply says, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, an hour when he doesn't know, and he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. I do need a little explanation. The master has put uh, certain... Um, oh, goodness, I need my words today. He's given certain... Criteria to Condition. each uh, slate, the, what they're to do. And now he's coming back to see if they've done what they were to do. And th this one in particular that we're talking about here uh, has not been a faithful servant, in fact, was completely unfaithful, did not do, even hid what he was given instead of doing what he should with it, did, didn't know when the master would come back, but the master catches him, that he is. is just absolutely in the wrong, nothing of value, nothing of good, and so he, uh, in essence, when he says he cuts them in pieces and assigns them a place with the unbelievers, we know the unbelievers are going to end up in hell. Cutting them in pieces, in essence, his life's going to be taken from him, and he's going to be cast into outer darkness, into the punishment that he deserves. Verse 47 says, that slave who knew his master's will did not get ready or act in accord with his will, will receive many lashes. So here's where we get the idea this one who really didn't even try to live the good life, to try to do good things, will receive great punishment. But the one who did not know it, the one who committed deeds worthy of a flogging, will receive but a few. So in other words, one who tried, still didn't know the Lord, didn't come to the right place for salvation, but didn't just act out a horrible life, this one, even though he's still deserving of punishment, his punishment will be less. It will be less severe than the one who threw all care to the wind and didn't care what he did to fellow mankind. Then it says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. To him they entrusted much, and of him they will ask the more. Again, we're looking at the faithfulness. The same way we talked about in our rewards, that one of our rewards is uh, ruling and reigning with the Lord. Not everyone's going to get to rule and reign. If they've not been faithful, not shown themselves responsible, not done the task be given to them, not show good judgment and good character, then why would the Lord entrust them in the future to be over a hundred people or a thousand people if they couldn't take care of themselves in a manner worthy of what they should in, in their little circle? Why would they be rewarded with something greater? The one who maybe never got off the block, so to speak, never went out and did great accolades, but was so faithful to the Lord, talked to the neighbors, helped others, did what they could, and of course, had that saving faith that believed in the Lord, this one was, will receive a great reward. In other words, we talked about, and I'll put it in terms that I think are quick and easy for you to understand when we talked before, we said, someone will say, oh, Billy Graham's going to have this huge reward because he led thousands and thousands and thousands to the Lord. Now, I'm not taking a thing away from Billy Graham. He loved, led, lived a very exemplary life. I'm sure his reward will be great because of his faithfulness to the Lord. But that little person who God said, witness to your family, witness to your neighbors, and witness to your co-workers. And that, that little person did. Maybe only led a couple people to the Lord in that lifetime. It did everything the Lord had asked that one to do. That one will receive a full reward. Not a partial reward. Not going to be compared and say, well, you know, Billy Graham gets a thousand and you get two. <laughs> it's not done in that way. They both were faithful to everything the Lord gave them. They're both going to receive a full reward. These two now that are standing here for judgment in their deeds will receive their deeds and the, the, the rewards of their deeds in that same way. If they sowed many evil deeds, they're going to reap that harvest and suffer the consequences of much evil, much wrong that they had done. And someone who didn't live a horrible life and didn't harm others and really did try to be a good person still stands rejected because they rejected the only only thing that can save, and I hate to call it a thing, the only way of salvation, which is the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So they're still an enemy of the Lord. They're still going to live separate from the Lord because they did not receive him. They did not choose him. And so they'll suffer that consequence, and that's bad enough. I'm not giving you any idea that hell at all is pleasant. 
is apart from God. Do I need to say anything else? God is love. God is joy. God is holy. God is righteous. God is beautiful. God is loving, caring. God is just. And God is just. But they're living apart from that means no holiness, no joy, no light. The light of the world is Yeshua Jesus. They're going to be in darkness. They're going to be in suffering and agony. They're going to realize that they've chosen to separate themselves away from this for all of their lives. So even if they've done nothing else but reject, that's bad enough. But then it will go on so that those who did the evil that deserves a just reward, uh, Hitler, the Crusaders, Son of Sam, you know, your, your serial killers, those who... Chuckle. Chuckle was mine. You know, that's somebody who is a very bad person who's alive today. I'll leave it at that because of the video. <laughs> but yes, you're, you're, I understand you, yes. And I'm sure we all have someone who comes to mind who did horrific deeds to others. They are going to suffer greater consequences, and rightfully so. They do deserve that judgment. And that's what we're looking at. As we go back now, we do see in the Bible that there is degrees of punishment. Then we see that's not just our idea, but it really is true. It really is just. It really is fair. And we learn that from the hand of God. So this, again, would even be why there needs to be a judgment. If there wasn't different degrees, if everybody was just going to end up the same way in the end, then God could just basically send them all in one big wave and done, over with. There wouldn't be any need for the judgment. But the judgment is so that it can be fair, it can be right, according to every man's life deeds and life works. Now, this should give comfort to all who have asked the question, what about babies? What about little children? Okay, are babies able to do works, think things through, and make decisions? No. So why would God judge them? Why would God hold them responsible? And as far as for when one comes to that age of understanding to accept or reject the Lord, there are little ones that can catch that very quickly and early in life. There are others who have to get a little bit older before they really have that full concept and that understanding. So that's why I believe scripture is silent on an age, because it isn't the same age across the board. I happen to be one that had opportunity to be taught it. I caught the concept. I was young. Praise God. I gave my heart to life, gave my heart and life to the Lord when I was young. But another one who didn't hear and wasn't being um, taught and didn't have the understanding on their own, it would be later for them. I taught uh, elementary school. I saw the difference in the ages. You've got a classroom that's basically supposed to be a two-year spread. For instance, third graders are supposed to be eight and nine. You'll have seven and ten-year-olds, but the majority are eight and nine. Does that mean they're all on the same page, the same place in development, and they understand the same, and they're, they're just little, little, you know, carbon copies? <laughs> How many of you have carbon copies in your own children? Did you not see a world of difference between Two children. I have yet to see two children that, I mean, they may look carbon copies, but they're not. You get to know them and they're not. I babysat identical twins. So identical, I prayed I put them in the right crib at night. <laughs> but when they were awake and on the move, <laughs> at eight months of age, I knew which was which. <laughs> so my point being, everyone is individual. God judges the individuals, but nowhere, nowhere in Scripture. Do we see judgment on children and babies? They're under the blood, is how we put it. God's love, his justness, his fairness, his rightness, his blood covers their sins. And they go into the presence of the Lord at that moment that their life is lost on the face of this earth. And let that come for any of you who have had that experience at any time in this life or know someone who has. Um, Let's also look real quick. I should have kept you there, but we can jump back and forth. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew's a good Jewish boy. I say that every time, but I want you to remember, think Jewish. Matthew 11, and verse 20 is where we'll start. Matthew 11 and verse 20. 
uh, right now, the complete Jewish Bible that keep us in that Jewish thinking. We should think with a Jewish mind all the way through scriptures because it's a Jewish book from beginning to end. <laughs> but here we go with, with Matthew and Matthew's words. Yeshua began to denounce the towns in which he had done most of his miracles because the people had not turned from their sins to God. So he's speaking judgment on this city after this city after this city because here he's been in their midst. He's done the miracles that Nicodemus said, we know you come from God because only God could do the things you're doing. He caught it. He was a Jewish man. He was a ruler. He had a bright brain. He caught it. He went to Yeshua. You know, I'm confused. I don't understand this, but I know you've got to be from God. So Yeshua is, is judging these cities that have seen his miracles, and they've still not turned from their sins to God. And he says to a couple of those places, Woe to you, Corsi. Woe to you, Bethsaida. What if the miracles done in you had been done in Sor and Sidon? They would long ago have put on sackcloth and ashes as evidence that they had changed their ways. He named a couple of towns known in Old Testament times that he's saying that if I had come to them, even though those were pretty evil towns, even they would have realized. They would have gotten it. But, and they would have uh, mourned. They would have put on the sackcloth and ashes and changed their ways. But I tell you, it would be more bearable for Zor and Sodom. How does it say it in yours? What's your English? Tolerable. Tire. Tire and Sidon. Tire and Sidon. Okay, there's your names for those of you who need that Tire and Sidon. Then for you on the day of judgment. So what's he warning them? You have seen a great light. You have been given much to, to see, to know, to understand, and you're turning away from it. Your judgment's going to be greater. You know, that's where I, is worry the right word? I, I have to say it because in my humanness, it is a worry. When we have been witnessing to someone for a long time, we have shown them, life has shown them, circumstances have happened, and there's been much opportunity for them to see, to come to saving faith. I come to the point where I do worry and think, wow, if they keep going this way, sinning against such a great light, their judgment is going to be so horrendous. That's what the Lord is saying here. That even these evil cities, if he'd done what he'd done there, they even would have turned around. They would have mourned and said, whoa, you know, like Isaiah did. What was me of unclean lips? They would have turned. And they, they hear you have had all of this. And you're rejecting it. And he's warning them. Your day of judgment is going to be severe. And you, Capernaum, uh, Capernaum will be exalted to heaven? No, you'll be brought down to Sheol. That would be to the suffering side you know, of Sheol. For if the miracles done in you had been done in Sodom, it would still be in existence today. Sodom, Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, he's saying they would have still been here. They were judged, but even they would still be in existence if the miracles had been done and they had turned. So everyone has that ability to turn, but he's giving it a great warning, and again a second time, but I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom than for you. Even though Sodom was judged harshly, and those people went to their death and are waiting in the suffering side of Sheol for this great white throne judgment, he's saying when they come up and they are judged for their, their sins, for the works that they've done and what they hadn't done in accepting him, it won't be as bad for them as it will be for you who are standing in front of me today who have seen me, heard me, seen the, the works, and have the testimony greatly in front of you. You sin against a greater light, greater punishment. So again, we see the greater degree. I'm reminded of what you told us before. The angels have no salvation because they sinned when they were right before the presence of God. Good reminder, good reminder, Rowena. To pick it up for sake of the video, if you did not hear her, as she said, she remembers how the teaching was brought out before, that when the angels fell, when they followed Satan, when Satan fell from, from heaven, when he was lifted up in pride and the others went with him, we read of no chance for them to ever get it right with God. God didn't send Yeshua Jesus, his son, to die for them. Now, we, in our humanness, all were in Adam and Eve, and they sinned, and God said, here's your way of salvation, and gave us the life-saving blood of Yeshua Jesus. What is the difference? I believe because the angels were right there in the very presence of the Holy God, in a perfect environment, had no reason to be, you know, they weren't blinded, they weren't confused, they weren't... Uh, um, 
There was no Satan then. <laughs> they they went to seek. They weren't to see. You know, it was open rebellion. And that open rebellion in the very presence of the Holy God is what he, I believe, why he condemned them to the degree that he did. Yes. And so that is a good point. And if that's true with the angels, we can see that principle here in the human life. So I think you all understand why there has to be the judgment. Why so many books? Because everyone's going to want to excuse it. We see that today. What is the number one excuse for sin today? It's someone else's fault. <laughs> it's someone else's fault. My mama fed me too many Twinkies. Well, my mama didn't feed me any Twinkies. <laughs> I don't care what it is. It's somebody else's fault. They try to push the, concert, the, the, the reason off on someone else. Same no one wants to own up. Same as the garden. Satan's garden. Okay. The garden of Eden. You know, eat right Adam and Adam. So, yes, yeah. you're right. Right back in the garden of Eden. I catch it exactly. I was saying, yes, yes. Eve blamed, well, first Adam blamed Eve, but then Eve blamed, blamed serpent. the serpent. And we do see that God did say the woman was deceived where the man willfully. And we do see that, that God had a greater. Uh, if, you know, he held Adam to greater responsibility, and there was a greater the consequence to his falling. But yes, all the way back through time. And, and you see it all the way through. You see it in your own little family, with your own little children. You see it in the classroom. You see it in the workplace. You see it everywhere you go. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, not me. Not me. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, so realizing this, they're not going to, to be able to be left let off the hook. I just got to say, it. in my teaching days, I had two little boys. So I won't use their names, but these two boys, one was the leader and the other was the follower. Mm -hmm. And the leader had a, a knack for knowing when to pull out just in time so that the consequence wouldn't fall on him. But his poor little follower was always confused <laughs> about that one. And I finally had enough of that because even though I wouldn't catch the first one, I knew who it instigated. So if I finally told him one day, when this one gets in trouble, you're in trouble too. Same punishment. And he looked at me to say it's not fair. And I said, before those words come out of your mouth, you and I both know who the instigator is, who starts it, and that this one wouldn't be doing it if he wasn't following your example. And he just looked real <laughs> sheepish and didn't say another word. We need to, to recognize self-responsibility, even for our lives now, not for salvation, but to be pleasing unto the Lord. You know, we come up with excuse, oh, well, you know, you didn't make me brave enough, Lord, so I was afraid to talk out. Hello? Mm -hmm. Did he say you have to be brave to talk? Can you hand a tract? Does that take bravery? Well, maybe sometimes in the circumstance, but overall, no. <laughs> leave it behind. Leave it on the table when you leave your tip. Walk out. There are great tips that, that, that are made for waiters and waitresses even. That follow right along with the theme. There are all kinds of ways to work for the Lord. So even though we're talking right now about the degrees of punishment for not knowing the Lord, still apply the principle and no excuse before the Lord. He's not asking you what somebody else did, but he's asking you, what are you doing and how, are, how is your relationship with me? Okay, back onto our great white throne that we are looking at the judgment of those who are without salvation. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Okay? We're contrasting now the sea gave up the dead. Earlier when we talked about the dead, and it was last class, but I don't remember what verse, and I don't know if I can find it fast, right in here, somewhere real close in here. Maybe, maybe it was at the start of 12 when we saw the dead. We talked about how the dead is, is talking about the uh, body that it's not talking about the spirit, it's not talking about the soul. When we say somebody is dead, we're talking about the body has ceased, it's living. We know that soul goes on and lives, okay? So now when we're seeing that um, the sea gave up the, the dead, we're contrasting it. What we're going to be looking at is that, um, that okay, the body goes somewhere, the, the body goes back to dust. We know that. I'm saying that wrong. But the spirit, the soul goes somewhere. Okay? 
So um, let me just get it from, from the scripture. It'll be easier because I'm tongue twisting myself. Okay, the seed gave up the dead which were in it. It can be referring to the bodies that have been dumped at sea, buried at sea, died at the end, shipwreck. It can be referring to those bodies. The soul, where is that soul? Well, here's where it makes it very clear. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Hades is a Greek word for the Hebrew word Sheol. So Sheol, remember, we know had a paradise side and it had a suffering side. The paradise side we know was taken out and placed in heaven. The suffering side continued on. So when it says that Hades gave up the dead which were in them, it's talking about where that spirit went when it was confined, when it left that body. When we are talking about, um, I've said the seed, and death. Death would cover um, everything else. The body placed in the grave. You know, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter where they die or how they die, everyone comes up before the Lord. Everyone is going to stand before the Lord in this judgment. Um, we're not talking about the grave when we talk about Hades, There's a, or Sheol, where there's a different Greek word for the grave. So again, I think it's just trying to show that it's everywhere, that it's, if you died on earth, in the earth, if you died in the sea, wherever you die, you didn't, you're not escaping this. Everyone is going to be brought into this. And again, when I'm using these terms, I'm talking about the unsaved, not about us, okay? Now, um, we can look at something else and see one more possible level. And I kind of think it may be and why it's being so specific here with giving, okay, there were dead ones in Sheol, in Hades. There were dead in the sea. Well, do you remember where we've talked about those who are, and who they are, who are chained under darkness, waiting the day of judgment. Who are we talking about? Do you remember? Angels. Angels. Okay. It is believed from Jude 6 that, that that's under the waters. Okay. When you study it, when you get into the scriptures, and maybe we'll even look at them. If we don't, yeah, we're going to look at them pretty close. In fact, it might just be easier if we did. Um, let, let me take you in an order, though. What I'm going to bring out to you is it could be referring to the angels that have, are being kept under the sea in judgment or waiting in, in chains of waiting judgment. That could be why it's saying they're going to come out for judgment also. The, the humans that have died, their, their soul is in Sheol, it's in Hades, it's in the suffering side, they're coming up. The angels will come up for judgment. It may be referring to it in a different way, in that way. Let's look at a few verses now and see what we're trying to understand. Go with me first to Isaiah 24. Isaiah. Okay. Yeshia, Isaiah, chapter 24. And we're going to start with verse 19. Isaiah 24 and verse 19 says, The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is taken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. Bless you. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. Okay. When has earth gone through this? When has it been broken asunder, split through, shaken violently? It's tottering like a drunkard. It's transgression so heavy upon it that it's fallen and hasn't risen again. No. It hasn't happened yet, has it? But does that sound like tribulation, great tribulation, culminating in the final? Yes, very much. And that the earth will not rise again because what did we just read in the beginning of verse 12? Heaven and earth fled away. We're not going to see the earth again as it is as we know it today. It's going to be gone. We'll see what happens because of that, but it's going to be gone. So here we get the idea. And did you notice there's two categories? When we get down to the Lord will punish, verse 21, the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high. Who's the host of heaven? Angels. 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 And he's going to punish the kings of the earth on earth. Who are those? Humans. Okay, so do we see two different judgments here? Or one judgment of two different types? That's a better way to put it. Okay, so there are angels who are going to be judged, and there are humans who are going to be judged. And I think that we're seeing that. So it could be if some of these angels, 
the worst of them, are the ones that were bound under darkness in chains, and it is referring to the sea, then that could be why we're reading here that the sea gave up their death. Okay? That we can't be 100% dogmatic, but I think we got a pretty good indication. Um, remember... Is this going to happen after the thousand years? Yes. Yes. We are all the way out here. <coughs> so the, I believe even with the earth fleeing and the, the heavens and the earth fleeing away, it's a shaking. Remember last, yes, last week we talked about Luo, the loosening like atoms that are coming apart that once held it together suddenly lets go and it's, you know, yes. And I do believe that the earth after the millennium is going to suffer that greatly. That we saw a difference when it talked about the judgment that came on it when the waters came on it in Noah's day. I also believe that the earth had judgment of water prior to Genesis 1 verse 2. Okay, if you don't know that thought, hang on, we'll get to it. But um, it didn't, it wasn't, it was, and we saw from the Greek, it wasn't a complete annihilation. It was, uh, it was, uh, oh, I can't think of the word in the Greek now. But there was, there's a different level. And I believe this is talking about that extreme, that now when the heavens <coughs> and earth are pulled away, so to speak, and God sets up this great white throne judgment, and we know that we we'll, we follow it with the scriptures of the new heavens and the new earth. That's what I believe we will see. Okay, and I'll show you why I think it's a brand new earth from scripture when we get to that point also. But we'll finish this first and go in order. Look with me real quickly at Ephesians six and verse twelve. I think most of you are familiar with this. I was on that. <laughs> go ahead. I was on that one. I don't know if you're hearing him, but I'm hearing him. He's saying it. Ephesians 6 and verse 12 tells us, For we, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against humans, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is one reason why I think the heavens are going to flee too, is because their judgment is coming also. Now remember, there are heavens. I'm not talking about God's heaven. I'm not talking about the presence of the Lord. I'm not talking about eternal home. That's not touched by sin, remember? That's why they couldn't even go into heaven before the Lord had died and resurrected himself because until then, the animal sacrifices only covered. They didn't wash away the sin. Once that sin was washed away, the blood put on the mercy seat in heaven, not the mercy seat on earth, which was a copy. Now, man can go into the presence of God because he goes right through that shed blood into his perfect holiness. And that's what made the difference. So we do see, you know, that there is something different here. We do see that we do fight today against the princes of Palatis, princes and... Princes Thank you. i got to slow down or something. <laughs> I still can't get it out. I can hear it twist my brain anyway in the high places, okay? We know what we're saying is we're fighting against Satan and against his hordes of, of evil angels. Do you know that's really what a demon is, is an evil angel? It's one of those fallen angels, not one that God said is so bad I won't even let them out, but it's one that he has allowed to serve his ultimate purpose. The same way Satan. It's not that God lost control and he's fighting back for control. No, that he is allowing the evil consequences to take, to take effect on this earth for a time. And then he'll pull it up short. Remember in the tribulation, enough is enough. Egog and Magog, enough is enough. With the evil angels, enough is enough. We're going to see their judgment also. Okay, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. 2 Kepha. My tablet does not want to work with me. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Kepha is bringing this out. He said, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, that's what we've, we've been talking about, but cast them into hell, some went right into it could be into the very lake of fire because we know that we're told in Matthew 25, 41 that hell was made for Satan and his angels. We know Satan, Satan is not there yet, but it, he's got angels apparently that are waiting for him there. I'm not going to say they're keeping it warm, but that would be the comment you would understand. 
Okay, he's committed them to <coughs> pits of darkness reserved for judgment. We talk about that. Under the waters of the sea is pitch black. We know that we can't get fully all the way down. We don't know how deep that is. No one, even though they'll tell you, oh, we've got to the center of the earth. No, they haven't. They may get close, but they don't know that they know that they know that they know that they've hit the center of the earth yet. And wherever Sheol is, they are not drilling into hell in many stories out there. I'll leave that, okay? But do you see how he is saying that there are these places and they're being reserved for judgment? Well, here comes the judgment, the great white throne. So I do fully believe the judgment at the great white throne is for humans and for angels. <coughs> and that's what I'm trying to bring out. Okay? And so I will be one who will say the sea, he probably is referring rather than to bodies that died at sea, it's probably referring to those <coughs> angels under the waters that are waiting judgment right now. <coughs> when you say there are different levels of rewards, are there different degrees of punishment yes. as well? Yes, so that's what I'm trying to say, yes. Yeah. Yes, different degrees of punishment, of suffering, the same way you even punished your children. If they did something really bad and they were in their teen years, you certainly didn't just a little slap on the hand and sit in the corner on the chair for a time out for two minutes, did you? But if they were two years old and, and were naughty at home, you gave them a time out on the chair maybe for two minutes. You know, you, you balance it accordingly. Well, again, Hitler, and I pick on him because he deserves it, deserves a great degree of suffering, a great degree of punishment. He brought horrible, horrible evil on the face of this earth and caused many to suffer. His degree of punishment, I believe, will be very severe. But if at the very last moment he was sorry. What happened to the thief on the cross? This is a thief. Now, who says what sin is the worst sin? A sin is a sin. Well, blasphemy is always fair is unforgivable, yes. But for sin, we'll say, if they told a little white lie, well, that's not as bad as killing that person or cheating that one or, you know, we put degrees on. But in God's eyes, there are some he hates more. He'll say, you know, he the, the sin of pride he hates the most. It always hits the top of his list. I believe that's because it's pride that started all this. And if you knew what brought all this evil on the ones that you love, you'd hate it too. I said the other day, because something that was going on, I, how much I hate alcohol. I've seen what alcohol does up front and personal. I don't mean my person, but to, to people very dear to me, I've seen the consequences of it. I hate it. Well, take that to the ultimate, to God, in every sin that has separated his loved one from him. He hates it all, but there are certain pet peeves. So I'm not talking about the pet peeves, I'll put it that way. But we're the ones who say murder is worse than that lie. You know, cheating is worse than, than you know, someone's calling another person a bad name. You know, we're the ones who do that. But when you stand, be not us, but when people stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment, all he's going to do for those differences is say, well, this sin does deserve more punishment. But you still are not permitted into my heaven because you have sinned. Not because you murdered, because then everybody who didn't murder would say, well, then you got to let me in, Lord, you got to let me in. That everyone is not allowed in due to sin, period. The way our Hebrew <coughs> scriptures put it, there were 613 commandments, and it said if you break one, you've broken them all. That's how God sees it. So in his eyes, sin is sin. Sin, sin is sin. But even in his eyes, he agrees that there is sin that deserves a greater judgment, sin that deserves a greater response of consequence because that's only fair and remember God is fair God is just God is holy when we have a judge sitting on the, the bench we want them to meet out justice do we not and how many of us have been very upset when we've heard an alcoholic driver let out for the third fourth time and then they kill a family 
because they were driving again under the influence. And we say if that judge had only done his job and stopped them. Now, it's not the judge's fault. It's the law's fault. But you get my point. Okay, we cry out for it. If we cry out for justice and fairness, if we want to see something done right, how much more? Where do we get that sense of just and rightness? We get it from the standard of holiness that our God has put into us to know so that we do know right from wrong. We do have that understanding. So that's what we're talking about. And, and again, they do deserve. These angels that sin in his presence deserve a consequence that's horrible. They deserve great suffering. Satan deserves hell and more. I guess I can't say that. What could be more? <laughs> but you get my point. Higher, the higher degree of hell. <coughs> yes, yes. And he will. He will. And even because he'll know what he left behind, because if you go back to his start before humankind, I fully believe that this whole earth was his kingdom. God had given him a whole kingdom. He was walking on top of his kingdom. It was a beautiful kingdom, and he was beautiful, and he had all kinds of talent and all kinds of abilities, and he lost it all. And how much more do you feel it if you've had it and lost it than if you never had it at all? So, but again, he deserves. Okay, did I answer? Because I'm almost afraid I got off track. Okay. Okay, all right. So, have we looked at 2 Peter 2.4? We, we did, we did, God didn't spare the angels, um, and I, I bring out to you that some are committed to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Keep that in mind now, with that thought in mind, go with now to Jude 6, which I think more of you are familiar with. Jude, there's only one chapter, so when I say Jude 6, it's verse 6 of the one chapter. And we read there, and angels, following that thought, who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Okay, they didn't keep heaven. That was their domain. They didn't keep it. He has kept them in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Okay, so there's some place dark that he's kept them. And from other places, and I thought I had it, maybe it's coming up. Let's try it. No, I think this just tells us we judge angels. Um, and that's 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and 3. We'll look real quickly at that. If you don't want to turn, I'll read it to you in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you <coughs> not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? Our judgment's going to come up in the face of those angels. When you read in Hebrews that the angels, are the good angels, not the demons, are ministering to the, those receiving salvation. And then we also read that the angels are looking into these things. They're puzzled by them. They're looking into them for understanding. What are they looking into? They're looking at that human. And I can just see, you know, I have to use the names we have from Scripture. Michael, Michael, Saint Gabriel, Gabriel. Hey, look, look at how God's going to the degree to save that human. I wonder why he loves that one so, and that one's done such a bad job of being good. <laughs> yeah, let's see if we can figure that out. And then the angels see where, where we know. How many of you know miracle stories? Wow, you know, and, and we'll say, my mom used to say kids don't grow up without guardian angels. They just don't. God's got the, an angel protecting them. We all see that. And the angels say, wow. Look at what God did, and he sent us to do this for them. You know, he sent us to do this miracle to help this one. Sometimes we know those angels that have even taken on human form. Because we're told, be careful about entertaining strangers, because you may be entertaining an angel unaware of it. And I think, again, we can all tell stories, either personal or have heard, of people who will say, that had been an angel. You know, and they looked very human. Very interesting. Go on all the rest of this class on that. Someday, maybe. <laughs> but, so here we are with, with this, that, that I believe that, that we have the right to judge those angels by our lives, not by what God's going to say is he'll point to those angels who will say, well, you know, God, you know, why should I be judged for following Satan? And God will point to a human, to Rochelle, and say, well, look, if she can live on that earth, apart from my holy presence, never have seen me, and yet was willing to believe, and I even used angels to minister to her in her life, 
how much more should you believe when you're the party of who could have been serving me in my presence, knowing my holiness, knowing my greatness, knowing my fairness, you know, where it's not tainted by sin. Heaven's not out of control. Heaven's not like earth. Thank God, who'd want to go there for eternity? <laughs> so God can use us as an example to those angels. You, more should have been required of you. Again, that little child that's been given a lot and knows better, you're going to call that one out. How many times did you say to one of your kids, you should have known better? <laughs> Are those not familiar words? Well, God will look at the angels. You should have known better. Look at my servant down there on earth. Even that one got it. And here on earth, it's, it's those where we went through those cities where God said, or the Lord said, you know, I'm in your presence. I've done these miracles. How can you not believe who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of that so often when they keep together in the garden. Just that one story alone. <laughs> Let's go there for a minute. Kepha, I love you. You are just so zealous for the Lord. I don't think he went for the ear of the guard that he took the ear off. I think he was going more than that. But all I got was the ear. I may be wrong, but I think he had every intent of taking out one of the Lord's enemies. You know, you're coming against the one I love. You know, I, I love it. Go, Peter, go. But this ear is on the ground, okay? I can see that. There's an ear down there. They see the Lord pick that ear up and put it back on. Okay, now, any of you, give me a body part of yours and let me put it back on. I can't put a fingernail back on. They saw that. That should have said to them, whoa, who is this that has that kind of power? Then let's go to the second level. And they ask him, who are you? And he says one thing. I am the great I am. It was so powerful, it knocked them off their feet, literally. They landed on their two cuts, as we say in Hebrew, in Yiddish. They landed on their little behinds, knocked off their feet by the power that came out of his mouth. Now, where does that not wake you up? How could they not have said, whoa, you know what? This one is. God, I'm not touching this one, and yet we don't see that. Yeah, and then they go on with what their intent is, of course, because God knew and was allowing them to work out their plan of evil, which was his plan for good. Because the Lord wasn't murdered. He didn't have his life snatched from him. He willingly went to that cross. He laid down his life. He gave it up, and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There was nothing snatched away from him because he couldn't handle it. And even when they railed at him and said, you saved others, save yourself, you know, coming down off of that cross, I imagine it took being God to not make crispy critters out of those mouths and not come them off the cross and say, okay, I'll show you my power. <laughs> but... How did the angels in a perfect heaven, in the presence of a holy God, choose to follow Satan over the Lord, over God? I don't get it. And I'm not going to tell you I do. I'm not going to tell you I understand. I do not. But I fully believe that they deserve punishment for turning their back on my God. And that's what we see. Amen. So, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Good to have you back. <laughs> we are in Revelation 20 and we are in verse 13 and we are talking about the difference about the sea giving up their dead, Hades or Sheol giving up their dead, the earth giving up their dead. What we're going to see when we get through to the end of this is that all are standing at the great white throne. Whether they were human or I believe the angelic will be judged here also, whether they died at sea, whether they died on, on earth, whether they were consumed in a fire so there's no body, or whether they were buried in a grave, whether they died 2,000 years ago, or whether they died the day before. Well, nobody died the day before, because there, there is no death. You know, we know the millennial, if they live out perfectly, if they lived 
you know, if they are obedient, they can live the time. So any who uh, did not, they went into um, the heart of the earth during this time. At Gog and Magog was the last of humans that reject the Lord and suffer the consequences. Okay, so how much time in between here? I don't know, but I tend to think next to nothing. You know, I, I'm sure it's not a span of time, or we'd have something being told to us that takes place. So anyway, my point being, it wouldn't be just the day before, but those who died all the way back in Noah's day, those who died in our day, those who died during the, the millennial reign of the Lord on earth, those who died at Gog and Magog, all the way through, we are seeing they're all being brought up at this time. That's why you have the one continuous line at the very bottom of our chart, chart coming up to this point. So, Michelle, yes. I have a friend, I told her that Gog and Egog, I thought, stood for Russia. That's, and she said, no, it doesn't stand for Russia at all. Okay, it does when it's in Revelation, um, chapter, okay, uh, before 19, <coughs> we've got, you know, actually, where it's mentioned Gog and Magog is in um, Ezekiel, it's Ezekiel of Daniel. Oh, come on, Michelle. It's someone that Google it for me. Um, or actually, it's probably right here. Okay, in Revelation 20 and verse 7, if I go to my hard copy, I'll have it. That Gog and Magog during the tribulation is referring to Russia. And we looked at that when we looked at the Gog and Magog afterward. You may not have been here last time with us. But when we did, we saw the reference, and I'll bring that out in a moment. <coughs> okay, Gog and Magog. Do I have it here? No, I don't. Okay. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38? Uh, Thank you. Ezekiel 38. I should have trusted myself. Yes, Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. Okay, Ezekiel 37 is Israel back in the land, dry bones. She is there. The Spirit of God is not in her. That's Israel today. She is in that land. If you think that she is a righteous people living under her righteous God and the way she should live, you will have 38 verse 2. You will have a rude awakening if you go to Israel because you will see Israel is a very carnal place. There are those in the land who want to please the Lord, the same as we have in America. But overall, the whole that is what I'm talking about. The nation of Israel is not in obedience to her God right now. She will be in the future, but she's not now. Ezekiel 38 and verse 2 is our Gog and Magog. And where it's talking about there, 37, I'm just giving you a description, 38 and 39 leads us into the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, that marker's done. Okay, Ezekiel 38 and... Verse 2 has Gog and Magog during the tribulation. Okay, because when we read chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, we see and understand that it's the same what we read in Revelation between chapter 6 and verse 19, which we know was the tribulation time. Okay, and uh, Gog is the name of the lamb, and Magog is the name of the prince. It names other cities, Meshach, Tubal. So we see it's an actual place that's being referred to, and it, we know that it referred to Russia during the tribulation time and in the scripture here. That when we read about Gog and Magog being listed in Revelation chapter 20, and I think we start with verse 7 for that, when we read it there, I'm getting it for you real quickly. Uh, okay, when the thousand years are ended, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So immediately, because we know time, we know that that's not speaking of the tribulation time. When is Satan loosed out of his prison? Well, he's got to be put in his prison, because is Satan in a prison today? No. no. Now, I wish he were, <laughs> but I can tell you, and it's the wrong way to say it, but he's alive and well on planet Earth. He's alive and sick on planet Earth, okay? But we know he is alive. The only time we read about Satan being confined in a prison is during the millennial time. So if this is saying after, when the thousand years have ended, and remember we had the thousand years given to us six times and six verses in chapter 20, so by that point we're taking it pretty literally that God means what he's saying. After the thousand years, that's ended. Then Satan's loose. So now we know we're not talking, we're not going back. It's after. 
So there's something after the tribulation that's been given that name. And let me put this up if you need that Revelation 20, 7 to 9. We're going to see that it is after, all the way, not just after the tribulation, but after the millennium. I think it's two of them. Yeah, I think that one's right. Okay, so, and we read there, um, he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. We saw the four quarters, the four corners, what we're talking about is it's worldwide. Satan's going to cover the whole face of the earth, of course, it's with his henchmen helping him, but he's going to go through that earth to get everybody he can. All the peoples that have lived during this thousand years, the ones who were born during the thousand years, because remember the ones coming in to this kingdom were believers. That didn't start with any unsaved going into the kingdom. The unsaved were being held in the pit until their time at the great white throne judgment. The believers, the sheep and goats judgment, remember Matthew 25 and the other judgments there, the believers start out the kingdom. They're in their human body still because they were not raptured before the tribulation period. They were not saved then. They got saved during the tribulation and managed not to be beheaded. The great majority will be beheaded, but there will be those who will live out the rest of the tribulation. The Lord comes, stops the battle of Armageddon, sets up his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and the <coughs> believers get to go into it. Now, because they have not been raptured, we don't read about them putting on immortality. We know we have. When we've been raptured up, we're no longer human. We have the new body, like the new Messiah, how do we put it? A Messiah's body, new body, when he came up out of the grave. And he said, clearly, it was flesh and bone. There was no blood. Remember, he shed his blood. In this life, the life of the flesh is the blood. If you drain somebody of their blood, they're dead. Remember, they did that to poor George Washington. They leached him. They thought they were helping cure him, and they were helping kill him. Okay? But in the millennial time, the new body that we that we as believers have had in heaven, we're no longer susceptible to decay, to dying, to, you, we can't die, you know, we, we can't suffer again. But the people who are living in the millennium are in their human bodies. They'll still eat, they'll still sleep, they'll still go to work, they'll still need people judging and ruling over them because that's what we're going to be doing and others with us, we look at the different people, and they're going to go on multiplying. So. Let's be conservative. Let's say, let's go real conservative. Let my little eat mine go easy, okay? We had, we, we had a, a hundred people that we started the millennium with. Thank God, I'm sure it'll be a lot more, but we start with a hundred. Those hundred, if they're married, now we got two, you know, we, we're down to 50. But let's say that those 50 conceptions and they kept having children and kept having children and kept having children because remember, they're only like a kid at 100 years. An old man dies in, in, at close to 1,000 years of age. They can live out the 1,000 years if they don't openly sin. If they stay in line, stay in obedience, they can live the whole time. So how many births can this mama have? She can have lots of births. She's not going to be worn out at 40 <laughs> or 50. Whatever age you want me to put in there, okay? She's not going to be old at 80. You can see a 100-year-old doing jumping jacks, okay? <laughs> Playing in the streets, okay? He does talk about the old man with his cane in the street of Jerusalem, but he's like a 1,000 years old, okay? Remember back before the flood when we didn't have the chemical broken up and we had long life? Methuselah lived 960. 69 years. We're going to go back to that time. Truthfully, I'm glad we don't live that long now. I wouldn't want to live in this, this long. But they're going to have children. And those children are going to have children. And those children are going to have children. And by the time you get to the end of a thousand years, you've got a multitude because there has to be so many that here when Satan is loose, the number that only feigned obedience that said, I'll do what the Lord says because I don't want to lose my life. But Inside, I'm rebelling. Well, that's the ones that Satan is going to catch. She's going to get him to follow him, and he's going to tell him, Look, you don't like that one on the throne. I don't like him. Either. I'm going to be king. You love being under me. Come on, follow me. Let's go get him. Let's take him down. You know, we can get rid of him, and we'll set up my kingdom. Because remember, that's what he's after from the very beginning. 
I will be like the Most High God. And he wants that worship for himself. And anybody who's foolish enough to fall for that lie is going to get what they deserve. Because what is he like? Look at today. He promises, and I'll take you to the, to, um, the, the European world. I'll take you to the Arab-Israeli conflict. I'll take you to, and, and again, I'm being careful of my words, but please understand. I love all people. I pray for the salvation of all. But the Muslim who is being taught, kill as many Jews as you can, who reads in the Quran that is, it's a shame for man to die in bed. He needs to die in battle. He needs to die taking out a Jew or a Christian. And he's being told, we're going to train you to be a martyr. Your family's going to get $25,000. They're no longer going to worry about how to get food on their table. They're going to have plenty to eat because you're willing to give up your life. And don't worry about that because guess what you're going to get? <coughs> and this is to appeal to the men. It certainly doesn't to we women. <laughs> you're going to get 72 virgins. Some are even told 72 virgins on 72 different colored mattresses, and they're just all waiting for you to be at your beck and call. This is what you're going to have the moment that you've lost your life. And the more that you take out, you might get even more than that. So go for it. So that person, brainwashed, who has ceased to be human, because to me, you can't be human and take life and not care. They're just robotic. They're just going through the stages. He gets to that point. He pulls that belt. He blows himself up, and he blows up so many others. And what does he wake up in? Yeah. 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 He wakes up in eternal punishment and torment. What kind of a master did he have who could fool him? And you know what Satan's saying? <laughs> one more. I've got one more. He doesn't care about that one and that one suffering. All he's caring about is I took one more away from God. That's how that she hates. My God. Oh, he, he deserves like I say, he deserves the worst of the worst of the worst, and he deserves it forever. But that's what's going on. And when it's referring to it here, that he goes through, it says it goes to the, through the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. It's using a terminology that says reminding them of a battle. The same way for us today, how many times have we used the expression, oh, they met their Waterloo there? Yeah. We're referring to who? Napoleon. Napoleon. Well, Napoleon lived in what, 13th century? Something yes. like that? Why are we using that expression in the 21st century? Did Napoleon raise from the dead? Was he the one that we're referring to and he met his demise and his final? No. What about Geronimo's last stand? <laughs> you know, we use these expressions. That's what they did with Gog and Magog. They used the expression of, of it, the battle. They use the expression of a chief who was against God and God's people. And that's what's meant here. So this Gog and Magog very clearly is separate from Ezekiel 28 because of the time, 38, sorry, because of the timing. The timing here is made very clear. It is after the millennium. So there's no confusion. Go back and read Ezekiel 38. You read about the battle that takes place with Russia coming against Israel, with all the others coming against Israel. And in chapter 38 and 39, sometime I'm going to remember and go and count how many times it says, and now the whole earth will know who is the Lord. The whole earth will know who is the Lord. The whole earth will know. That's why I know that that's at the end, very close to the end of the tribulation time. Because when does the whole earth finally know, and from that time forward, know who is the Lord? When he returns in all his glory, when he puts right, puts his feet on the mount of all, he stops the battle of Armageddon and sets up his kingdom, and the world knows. Now, unfortunately, those humans born don't want them to be. And so they rebel and they go. But see how the two times are very different? It's just a, a name given the same way we give a name to something else. Wouldn't God, wouldn't Yeshua know? whether the person was genuine about their obedience? He or... absolutely knows. But if they stay in line, mm -hmm. they're feigning obedience, he knows the heart. It, he just doesn't call them out in the same way. Look at the first church, okay? You've got Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit. 
they're called out by the disciples and boom, they fall dead right there. That was an example to teach to the church. You don't lie to the Holy Spirit. You don't come up against the Holy Spirit and think that you're not going to suffer consequence. So in the same way, I think there probably will be an example or two in the millennium where someone's going to quickly be met with a very severe, very fair, but very severe consequence because it says the Lord rolls with a rod of iron. That rod of iron, that's not something soft and comfortable. Do you want to be hit by a rod of iron? Do you want a rod of iron coming down on you? No, what that's talking about is power. That's talking about harsh, but fair and right, because the Lord never judges wrong. So it will still be right. We, everyone will see that one got out of line. The same way we look at third world countries today, and the countries that are very low with theft and with stealing, you know what the consequence is if you're caught stealing? You lose a whole hand. Anybody lost a hand for a little while? A finger for a little while? You miss it, don't you? <laughs> I got a compromised hand. I talk from what I know. The thought of losing an entire hand. Now we know that we see people who are born without and do amazing things, but we still stand in awe and think, wow, because we know how valuable it is. And even the hand alone tells me that evolution is a lie. That hand is so master-minded. You didn't get four thumbs, you didn't get five fingers. You got four fingers and one thumb. And what you can do because you got that one thumb? Oh my goodness, is that not amazing? And those who want to believe that, oh well, it came along because you needed it? Well then how come an octopus has eight arms and a mom still has two? <laughs> took a long time to catch on. <laughs> Evolution teaching that, well, it came along and it developed and it got best. No, no. Then how come we're deteriorating? How come we're going backwards? How come we don't see the improvement? And there's so many more arguments than that. But my class today is not to teach you against evolution. It's just, I laugh at the audacity. Throw, throw the parts of a watch up in the air and have it come down and come together and be a watch. You got a better chance of that than you have of the evolutionary process. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah I mean, is proving the Bible correct. Right, right, exactly. Even math alone proves God's existence. Amen, amen. I agree with you. If you didn't hear me, he said even math alone proves God's existence. Math, science, archaeology, history, Give me anything, every level, every way, a test to our holy God. Mm -hmm. And that's why even the one in the jungle who has no verbal communication with someone who knows the Lord has that opportunity to know the Lord. And we know the stories that have come out where they have come to the saving knowledge of the Lord. He puts inside of everyone a spark to believe in, to have that faith, and the light that, that to see and to be drawn to it. And if they're drawn to it, he'll give them more light. And he'll give them more light. And he will see that no one perishes. Not by lack of knowledge. Not by lack of someone telling. Not by lack of where they lived. Whether they were poor. Whether they were rich. No. There's no excuse. Remember by the time we get here, we can look through every period of time. And they can say, if my environment was perfect. Well, the environment was perfect for Adam and for Eve, and how much did it gain them? Mm -hmm. If they would have done better, wouldn't God have put them there? <laughs> we see, if I only had to go by my conscience, we've got the first murders. If I had only had to go by law, I'm skipping some in here, but by law, that the, by the time I get to Moses, it was promised first, then by law. If I only had to go by God's promises, if you didn't make it so rigid, I could have done it. Well, in Abraham's time, no one made it. By the time we get to the law, if I only had law, if you had written it down, if you had given it to me black and white, well, did they keep, anyone keep the law? Remember, if you break one, you break them all. The only one who kept the law and kept it perfectly was Yeshua Jesus. All the way through. Oh, have you given me a wonderful environment? If I could have seen you, Lord. Well, hello. I hear. I hear. So no excuse. Nothing. Whatever they want to say when they stand before there is it. And their, their uh, works will come before them to solidify what I'm saying. 
So, getting back on track, we'll go back to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14, on the way back to Revelation 20, and in 9 and verse 14, this is the time when we have uh, the sixth trumpet. Uh, verse 13 tells us that the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, when saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, they weren't sitting on top of the waters or standing there and in some way chained where they could be seen. We know that, that what it's talking about is they were bound under the waters of the Euphrates. We know that they come up out of the pit. I think that's in this chapter also, is it not, where it talks about them coming up out of the abyss? Yes, the first verse. Fifth angel sounded, I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to earth. That's an angel that he was given as a bottomless pit. He opened the bottomless pit, smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, the sun and the air were darkened, then up out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and it goes on, okay? In essence, what I'm trying to tell you is we see that there is a pit. We see that it is underwater. It talks about these angels that were being bound under the waters, under the Euphrates, and we get the idea from this and other scriptures that it sounds like in the depths of the depths of the waters is a prison house for the angels, that they are bound under it for a time. Uh, when it talks about the darkness, the abyss is dark. I'll get into that in a little bit when we get into the abyss. We'll use that more. But my point is, if the sea is like a prison house for the fallen angels, then we do understand why the original earth was covered with water in that judgment. When Satan's kingdom was judged and angels were judged with him at that time, some so severely that they are not allowed out during this period of time that has gone on since that episode happened. Now we understand maybe why 71 to 75 percent of this earth is covered with water. <coughs> and the oceans hold 96.5 percent of all of Earth's water. We don't realize how deep the deep of the deepest deep Yes, but we know that, that where God has contained them is where man cannot go. You know, this, this is what we're talking about. Okay, now that would also make sense then when you go to the story of uh, Yeshua when he cast the demons out of the human and they didn't want to go back to the pit, the pit being where they would be confined when they're in the pit. The only time we read is like Revelation chapter 9 where permission was given for something specific to come up out of the pit. Otherwise, they could not come up out of the pit. And remember, the pit's like a bottomless pit. Like they, they just, they, they, they think they're continually falling. They can't climb up. They don't have anything under their feet. They're not, you know, in a place where, oh, well, I can get out of here. No. No, only when God opened it up to let these out do we see it. Well, when the demons begged the Lord not to send them back to the pit. They knew if they were sent to the pit by the Lord himself, it's over. They're going to be in that pit forever. They don't want, or until the pit goes into the lake of fire, because I believe everything ends up in the lake of fire. They didn't want that. They wanted to, to be able to still have their freedom. <coughs> so, and this is where God's got to have a sense of humor. Forgive me, it's not mine, but somebody called it devil down. <laughs> they let the demons go into the pigs. The pigs were a non-kosher animal. Jesus is Jewish, living a kosher life. Obviously, this is an area where the, the Gentiles were also, because you would not find a Jewish person with a pig farm. But here is a pig farm in essence, so we know it was in the area. And the Gentiles were permeating throughout in the Galilee area and all, too. They were living side by side. They went into the pits. The demons went into the pits. But here's here's my thought. If it just stopped there, then they could get out of that pit because we know they indwelt humans and came out of humans. That, that we read about all kinds of stories like that in our scriptures. And I can't see the Lord Himself allowing them that freedom. And He didn't because what happened to the pits? <laughs> Where did they end up? In the, in the pit. In the waters. The waters enveloping those demons, they went right back into the pit anyway. I just see. Say, okay, I'll give it to you. No way. You go through those unkosher animals, right into the pit where you belong. He did not leave them the freedom to go out and play. <coughs> okay, so. Yes, yes. 
Yes, on the face of this bird, yes. Well, they, they just can't exist. Yeah, they just can't exist. By the way, the story I'm referring to is Matthew, Matthew, chapter 8, verses 28 to 32. So you know, when you want to look it up and read it, you know what I'm talking about. I didn't just come up with an idea in my head. Okay, and then here's a final clincher why we believe that the sea is what's confining the, the demons, these, these worst of the worst angels for this time. In our new heavens, the new earth, I'm sorry, not the new heavens, but in our new earth, when we start Revelation 21, we find there's no sea in it. And before all of you surfers have a fit, say, oh, but. <laughs> well, number one, it's not saying there's no water. There's no sea. Okay, we have the river of water flowing from the throne. We have the trees for, the, for food on you know, each side of it. So we're not saying an area devoid of water. We're not saying something that's beautiful is gone. But if the sea is representative of this evil, if the sea is housing them, then that's why the sea is gone, because there's no need for the housing of these evil demons. And if God takes anything away that you think is something, Oh, what do you think he's going to replace it with? <laughs> yes. You have no clue, but I guarantee you, you are not going to have one moment up there in heaven where you're going to say, I miss the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is lacking. Nothing is less. Everything is more. Everything is better. Remember the book of Hebrews? The key word? Better. Better, 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 better. And where was everything that was better? In heaven. The better ark, the better tabernacle, the better blood placed on the better mercy seat, and the better heaven, everything better. How could you think anything would be lacking? That's, again, just our little finite, like a little kid having a fit because a candy store isn't going to be there, and you're laughing and saying that you've got a whole world full of anything you want to eat. Wow. Yes. And you won't gain weight. And you won't gain weight. <laughs> and, you won't, and you won't have sugar diabetes. <laughs> yes. I was just curious. When we when we all get to heaven and we get all everyone gets their rewards, no one is gonna be envious of someone getting better rewards, right? Envy no. is sin. Oh, no. There's no more sin. You have a new mind, you have the mind of Messiah. Right. We will be rejoicing with the others with what yes. we see. The only thing I think that we can possibly feel, and you can argue with me because, again, it doesn't belong in heaven, but I would think that I would be saying to myself, oh, I wish I had more for the Lord. I wish I had even more. Because what do we do with our rewards? We give them to him. We cast them at his feet. We say, here, remember how I told you that I brought that out many a time before. Someone does something really wonderful for you, and what's the first thing you want to do? Reciprocate. In some way, reciprocate. That's what he's doing. He's leaving us not empty-handed. He's giving us a chance to, do, to reciprocate, to give something back, to say, you know, this is all I have. This is, this is the treasure you've given me. I treasure it because you gave it to me, Lord, but I treasure it so much I want to give you my treasure. So, no, we're not going to look and say, you know, I'm jealous of this one. No. Do we all think that we are going to wish we'd done more? We do think that. How could we not? I don't know. We'll find out. But, uh, no regrets. Maybe no regrets. No regrets. No sorrows. No negatives. That's why. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yes. Yeah. Um, Raquel, what you were saying, punish less severe. What do you mean, less severe? They are still in eternal torment. They're still apart from the presence of God. So it's no picnic. It's no neutral. It's no that it isn't negative. But in some way, the anguish and the suffering is going to be greater <coughs> on a Hitler than on a sweet little woman who tried to live a good life. I don't know how that will be. I, we know from the, um, the picture that we're given at the suffering side in Luke 16, which we know is a real picture, even though there's... Um, parables around it, God used a, God, I'm sorry, Yeshua Jesus, who is God, used a real name of a real person who lived a real life at the time he was talking about. So we know that that meant, I'm not telling you a parable, I'm telling you a true story. So we know from that, that the rich man was suffering so much, hot and miserable, that he just wanted water put on the tip of his tongue to quench his thirst. 
So that tells us it's suffering and it's agony. But maybe he's only feeling it on, in his mouth like when we're really, really, really thirsty. Mm -hmm. And Hitler's feeling it from head to toe. I don't know. I don't know. But it, no matter what, <coughs> the greatest torment is the separation from God. Mm -hmm. The separation from love, from perfection, from holiness, from purity, from joy, from happiness from his presence from everything and knowing they did it to themselves knowing I could have had that and this is where I am and now know that that's going to always be that's hell right there that's hell right there yeah so I don't want to give you an idea that there's any spot in hell that's not miserable no every spot is miserable but in some way Maybe, maybe even if I use fire, the closer you are to the fire, the more it does hurt. Maybe like that. I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> Thank God I won't know. If the lost can see us um, in heaven, would that be a great punishment for them to see what they're missing? I believe. See in heaven and see yes. us rejoice. And even heaven. if they're not seeing it with eyes, they are aware, they know. Because they stood at this judgment. They stood in God's miraculous heaven. They were not in his heaven where he dwells because sin is never allowed into that heaven. But they stood in space and saw. And even just knowing who God is. Because that's where, again, I dwell more on the character and the loss of that than I do on what we're seeing, you know, than the, the jewels and the beauty and the, you know, all to enjoy. I do more on the lack of everything that God is, is lacking here. The great opposite. That's why I'm trying to say, what can I say to you? You know, thankfully, no one in this room has ever felt 100% no love. We haven't. We just haven't. Some may have gotten very close, but never 100%. The fact that you're here, the fact that you believe in the Lord, you know you're loved. Okay, so no matter what your human circumstances were at some point, you came to know that love of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now imagine, if you can, I, I can't totally wrap my head around it, but that lack, there is no love. Can you imagine a world with no love? Well, that's really what hell is. Hell is a, a world to itself. There's no love there. There's only agony. There's only suffering. There's no joy. There's no happiness. How many times have you comforted yourself when you're in a lousy place and it stinks and it's miserable and you've reminded yourself, it'll come to an end. My mom's favorite way of saying it, she used scripture. She says, and it came to pass. And she would say, it didn't come to stay, it came to pass. Mm. How many times you can encourage yourself in that hard trial? It came to pass. It's going to pass. The better day is coming. The rainbow is coming. The storm is going to end. I know that I know that I know it's going to get better. Amen. Well, all of that, they have to say the opposite. I know that I know that I know it's never going to get better. It's never going to end. And it's not like they go to sleep and they wake up, but in essence, it must hit them like a tidal wave again and again and again. This is their, their abode, their forever, for eternity, for eternity. They never get to be in the presence of love. They never get to be in the presence of light. Have you ever experienced pure darkness? We were taken into the caves the, the, where you see stalactites and stalagmites um, when I was nine. And my daddy held me in his arms when they said they were going to turn out the lights. And, you know, for a split moment, we would get just a, a feeling for a moment of what pitch black was. I still remember that moment. And there's a fear that grips you. I remember being so glad I was in my dad's arms. I didn't know why he put me into his arms. I soon knew why he put me into his arms. That was a split second, and it affected me. They're in darkness forever, forever. And then I am forced to go to a place I don't like to visit. I went through the death of my neighbor whose house caught fire, and he didn't get out in time. 
I raced in when his wife said, he's in there, to try to get him out. I was not in danger. I don't want to give you any idea that, you know, I got burned. No, I, I, the lungs took it in. Everything's falling. Everything's horrible. In my mind's eye, when I go back, and believe me, most of it, my mind has chosen to block, and I leave it there. But the little bit I remember, in what moment you're... You're aware of the fire and the light that comes from fire, but at the same moment, it's gross darkness. You know, you're looking for something that's gross darkness. How do you explain that? I can't. But the horror of that moment, the horror of finding him, and he was already gone, but the horror of finding him, still, I feel it talking to you today. It still troubles me. And this is one human. This isn't the massive number of people who have turned their back on the Lord and are in something worse than that. But that gave me just a glimpse. Just a glimpse. And that's on earth. That's not as bad as hell. And that's so bad, I don't want to even let my mind go dwell there. I pray, Lord, take as much of that from my mind. At first I prayed, take it all. And he spoke to me and said, I want to use this in your life. And I, okay, Lord, okay, I'm yours. And I see, because I can bring to you a little more reality of a help. And if you don't think that lights a fire in me to talk to my neighbor, to hand that tract out, to do what I can, I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't even want to see enemies go to hell. Not when I really catch what hell is. I, I can't be that mean that I can wish him on wish out on anyone other than someone. He deserves it. He deserves it. I have no pity for him. But outside of that, this is what we're saying. And I don't want to class to end here. I've got something to have to leave. I'm going to move us on because I really don't want to end on hell. We got past it. Remember, we got to put all this behind us. We need to go to the glories of heaven. But just realize the gift God has given us is presence forever. Holiness, just, light. Who knows what things he's given us to enjoy? You know, we. I want to go explore this universe. And this universe is tainted by sin. What's he got when he makes that new heavens and that new earth? What's that going to be like? I can hardly imagine. Have you seen his creativity through the Hubble telescope? Have you seen colors and designs that just blow your mind? And then talk to someone who is, and I don't like the name, but they call them idiot savants because part of their mind is the savant is working perfectly, but the other part of their mind, they're like an idiot. It's like a, one that I knew that, that could play any instrument, could orchestrate an entire symphony, could write it all to for every, every uh, instrument, and he was six years old. But he couldn't tie his shoes. He couldn't dress himself, and he never was going to be able to in this life but in this other area, and, and they asked him, how do you do your music? And, and he's, he just, he looks at them funny, it's like, it's in my head. You know, it just has to come out. Well, yes, he's a genius in that area. That gives us a glimpse into that perfect mind. That gives us a glimpse into the perfections of God, still tainted by sin, still on a human level. But it's like, wow. And so I say to all of you who love music, because I've got an adopted son who is, that's his area. What orchestra is he going to hear that he hasn't heard yet? And he's not going to just hear it. He's going to go join and be a part of it. He's not going to be on the sidelines. He's not going to have to try out and hope he gets picked. He's going to be in it. Then for those who are like me, who music isn't your thing, like I say, I want to go explore. I want to see these planets, these what all God's created. I love God's creation. It blows my mind, and I want to see it all. I want to see everything I can. What turns you on? It's on an earthly level. Take it to the next. Let your mind go. Blow the top up of your mind. Leave it open and let the Lord fill it up. That's what he's got for you. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard what God has repaired, for prepared. Not repaired. <laughs> for those who laughed you. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you get to have it forever. But I'll tell you, the cream of the crop, the top of the top, the end all, be all, and you all know where I'm going. Amen. I get to see my Lord face to face. 
I get to be in his presence, bathed in his love, in that Shekhinah glory. I get to be there forever. And you know what else? I'm five feet tall here, and I don't mind that. But that means that I spend a lot of time seeing the backs of people's heads. And you know what? When I'm in heaven with the whole army of people who are in heaven with me, I'm not going to see the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to see him like I see you, face to face. That's glory, hallelujah, for all the short people. <laughs> No, I'll take you because I know I'm losing time, but I want you to have the glories. You all know how God has blessed me with using the rainbow in my life. I refuse to give the rainbow to Satan and to those that he chooses to warp because all he does is counterfeit gods. Remember, I'm not giving it over. So I see the rainbow in its pureness from the Hebrew being God's gift. God gifted it. That's what he says in Bereshit, in Genesis, he gifted his rainbow. To me, it is like the signature of God on his promise. I love the rainbow. God has used it many times in my life, and like the rabbis of old, who wouldn't even look at the rainbow because they thought it was God's glory, I feel his glory when I see the rainbow. Now let me take you to the blessing for all of you. I think God gave me a little sneak peek, okay? I don't have scripture and verse, but I got a little sneak peek. Science tells us when I'm looking at a rainbow and you're standing right next to me, we're saying, wow, look at the beautiful rainbow. And we think we're seeing the same rainbow, but we're not because the rain and the sun have to line up in your eye in a certain order for you to see. So this eye standing even this close to me is seeing a different <coughs> rainbow than my eye is seeing this rainbow. Okay? But we think we're seeing the same rainbow. I think that's how it's going to work in heaven. Mm -hmm. We think, each one of us thinks we're seeing the Lord face to face. We've got that one on one, nothing in the way. I can see the Lord straight on here, but Ruth can see the Lord straight on here. And um, <laughs> Judy <laughs> can see the Lord straight on here. And just take that out so that we all feel like we are the apple of his eye. Oh. We've got that number one face to face. Face. I get to just gaze in his face forever. Now, I guarantee you, it'll take me up maybe a split second, if that long, to be on my face, <laughs> seeing his pierced feet for me. But each one of you also. You're not going to be 5,000 people deep hoping to get a glimpse and that one day you get to come up and see him and then you got to go back to the back. No way. And to me, that's the jewel of heaven. The jewel. We can be. God right now hears all our prayers at the same time in different languages, different time zones, different places, and he has no problem deciphering it. So if you want to talk to the Lord at any split second in time, you go right ahead and he will respond. One to one, as if it's just you and him. Remind me of what my grandmother awesome. said to all 22 first cousins of mine. She had 22 grandchildren and uh, a lot a lot more great grandchildren. She would say to everybody, you're my favorite. Yes, yes. I had it much easier growing with my kids growing up that were my nieces and nephews. I had two boys and I had two girls, but the ages were different. So on their cards, I'd write to my favorite 11-year-old nephew. <laughs> and the other one was my favorite 8-year-old nephew. You know, I was safe every time. But the beautiful thing is God doesn't even have nieces and nephews. He doesn't even have grandchildren. All he's got is children. And each child should feel like they were the apple of their parents' mm -hmm. eye. When you're talking about God, you will. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you've waited a long I, time. I was going to say that here, we have each one of us has that personal relationship, that taste of heaven. And it's I a have taste. a personal relationship yes. with God, and so does everybody else. Yes. He is so personal with each and every one of them. That is, that is mind-blowing right there. It is. It is. And now take that and take that, grow it up into the heavenly level. You know, when um, I heard word, and it wasn't Grace, it was someone else recently. Uh, in fact, it might have even been here in your, I think you said it too, Rowena, the second time that I've heard it put that way. Um, I'm looking, but anyway, they graduated to heaven. I love that because it is a graduation. It is a 
coming up. And when you graduate from elementary school, you think junior high is the greatest thing. When you get from junior high to high school, oh, you've made it. When you get out of high school and you get to college, yay. Well, hello, heaven. <laughs> Let's move on just a little bit. We'll come to a, a good place to stop. We did kind of get bogged down, but I just, I want it to be real. I want it to be alive. I want it to be meaningful. I want it to touch you. So um, here where it says, and I, we need to go back to verse 13, Revelation 20 and verse 13. Oh, I'm in Revelation, okay. Let's just go to chapter 20 and verse 13. And we read, okay, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. I think we've talked about it. And they were judged. Every one of them. Now, you may have every man, okay? The Greek literally is saying everyone, every, each one or everyone, is giving it in a little more ambiguous language which could easily incorporate every man, every angel, every, you know, the, the demons. I mean, it could easily be giving room for that in the language, though, the way it's saying it, according to their deeds. Now, remember, that's not us. We're not in this group, but all of mankind, angelic, whatever. That's what we're seeing. Just the ones on earth. The ones that, time are the the ones that have been raised to stand before the great white throne judgment. Yeah, we've been in heaven for a long time. <laughs> we're going to be out there for eternity. Wait till we get the description of this. That's our home. It's coming. We'll get there. We'll get there. I thought next week it might be two weeks, but we'll get there. Let's see if we can tie up this, though. Okay, verse 14. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Okay, Hades, remember again, the Greek word. Sheol, the Hebrew word, but Sheol, we're used to thinking of two compartments. Usually when you hear Hades, you're equating it more with hell, so it's probably a better picture because we're talking only about that, that suffering section. It's all cast into the lake of fire. That means that now there will be no, and remember when the earth was removed, obviously that suffering, that, that tank had been taken out of the heart of the earth where it's been for earth to be removed and for those who were in it to be brought up to stand at the great white throne judgment. But now the punishment from the great white throne judgment for every single one, angel or human, is to be cast into the lake of fire. That's where they're going to spend eternity, so now there is no need for any more Sha'ol, any more holding place. No, it's gone. It's going to be done away with forever. Death and sin will never enter the new heaven and the new earth. Never. Never. Grow that word up too, okay? And forever. Never. So we've got... Death being that last enemy that has been totally put down now. What did we read in 1 Corinthians? We go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we are looking at verse 25. Verse 25 and 26. And we read, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished we'll be is yeah. death. This is what we're reading about the fulfillment. This, in essence, is a death. This is a cessation of life as we know it, even though the spirit lives on forever. We've said that all along. The first death that we had here, we said they died. That, that spirit lived on, we know. So, But death is done and over. Now... When we go back to Revelation 20 and verse 14, I think we had just have time to cover this. And again, it's, I want to get past the, the negative. The, mm. um, in verse 14, the death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is identical to Gehenna in the Hebrew. I'll put it up here for those of you who want it. I'll do it in red. I think it's fitting. Okay, Gehenna. Gehenna is uh, a place that is familiar from Scripture. Um, it literally, from the Hebrew, is <coughs> the Valley of Hinnom. And I can spell that out for you. That's what it means, is Valley of Hinnom. Now, let me give you the history of the Valley of Hinnom real quickly, and you'll see why the Lake of Fire is being given that name. Okay? 
All the way back, we read about it in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. It's in your uh, cross-references I've given you. You can look it up and read it on your own at home because I'm trying to beat the clock. Oh, I'm in everybody's way. Sorry. I put it up there nice and low, didn't I? <laughs> I'll keep trying to move. Okay. That's where we read Manasseh. You may say Manasseh was the king of Judah at that time, the king of Judah. And here is one of the lowest points of Israel's backslidden times, human sacrifice. This is when they would give their children to Moloch. I won't go through the horrors of telling you. If you want to know it, ask me one-on-one -on -one or go read it on your own. But it was human sacrifice that was given in the fire to a, to a stone that they were calling a god. That's how bad it was. But it was fire, fire consuming human life. That's why it was given that name. Jeremiah 7.31, just one place. There are other places also. Now, in Yeshua's day, when Yeshua was walking on the face of the earth, the area that, that had the name, the Valley of Hinnom, the area that had the name, or was called Gehenna, was where they kept the fire burning constantly. They burned the rubbish and the trash constantly. It was a very foul-smelling ugly and you, you can imagine the smoke the sulfur everything that was constantly coming up and it was continual it was not a place anyone would want to be you, you'd get rid of what you had to and get away from there but that was what it was like in yeshua's day a place of the rubbish burning continually and yeshua himself used that to illustrate eternal punishment because he referred to how the fires of Gehenna continually burn the fires is uh, that O-M, yes. O-M. I didn't write it very well, did I? Let's put it up here for all of you who have been struggling. Hinnom. Sorry. Sorry. It does look like an M. It does. It does. I'm hurrying people. Hinnom. Okay. Okay. So, now. Where the fire has burned before, fire can't come again. You know how firefighters will set a back fire to keep uh, a fire from being able to jump and to spread. They'll do it, you know, hoping that it will catch up, and usually it works pretty well. Well, in essence, and do not take this the wrong way, because you know you've heard me loud and clear, Yeshua Jesus never went into the fires of hell. He went into paradise by his own words out of his mouth, today you will be with me in paradise. And that was the thief, and I never followed through, that's where I dropped it with you. But how the thief at the last moment in his life knew, was felt bad for his sin, recognized who the Lord was, and the Lord granted him eternal life. It's not on the basis of our works, it's on the basis of God's grace. So, the Lord, in essence, took the fire for us. He took the punishment for us. He paid the penalty of sin, which is death for us. I'm not saying he went into hell. But, and he said on the cross, it is finished. He couldn't have said that if he had to go into hell. Right. Nothing comes out of hell. Nothing. Even the what came up out of the abyss, out of the pit that we read in Revelation 9, the two different times that we read that, that's not hell, <clears throat> lake of fire, here. Nothing comes out of the lake of fire that was made for the devil and his angels. Okay? But we know in Romans 8, 1, it says, There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in, and you're used to it in your English, Christ Jesus, but to those who are in Mashiach, Yeshua, the Messiah called Jesus. Okay? Um, we know that hell is unquenchable fire. I have, uh, actually, I was wanting to hurry, but I see that I'm going to go into a little more on what Hades is, what paradise is. Uh, we'll just sum it up next week when we come back. We can sum it up pretty quickly, but we will look again at that terminology of the Hades, of the abyss. There's another word, Tartarus, that we haven't touched on yet, that I want you to understand what these words are. And then again, Gehenna, and I think, I, yeah, I did spell it clearly enough there. Okay, we'll look at that real quickly, but then we will be able to go from that into something a little more positive. We're going to again look at the Book of Life. Um, we're going to look at what, what that really is saying. Um, we, we pretty much touched on it. Next week is going to be just kind of a, um, 
it's like if you've been introduced to all this, but now you're getting that refresher course and you're getting it all, you know, where you, you really understand it, you've got it solid, you know it, and you can move forward. From there, we'll move into the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? So we do have, I wanted to get through all this, but I see there's just no chance. So, yes, Eric? Yeah, you're going to go over the, the Book of Life and at the foundation of the... Yes, I was going to. I promised that last week, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Because I, I asked the question, when was your name written in the Book of Life? Who did their homework? Because I said, if you know the answer, do you know the scriptures to back it up? Eric's ready? Okay. We'll pick that up next week then. If you don't know, if you don't know the answer, you've got to get the answer first. But then if you do know the right answer, back it up with scripture. That's what I want to encourage you. Back it up with scripture. Because when you know it from the Word of God, nobody can take it from you. You know that you know that you know. <laughs> when was your name written in the book of life? And that's really a trick question. When you get the right answer to that, to be able to back it up in scripture. Okay, but I, I'm giving you a big hint. That's a trick question. When was your name written? Okay, there's a new name written down in glory. Oh, it's mine. Oh, it's mine. How many know that song? <laughs> Is that a good song? No. We'll answer next week. <laughs> we'll answer next week. I've read a few other things for you. There is something about a new name too, is there not? There's something about a new name also. So, what name's written, Rowena? Rowena. <laughs> I will give you an A+. Plus. <laughs> Very good answer. We'll talk about that. If I forget to bring up that part, please remind me because that, that's important too. So we will. We'll look at, again, we'll be into that book of life, into when the name is written. What does that mean? How do we back it up by scripture? What about that new name? Because that, that, we've been promised that in Revelation also. So we'll tie that in too. So we'll not just be on hell and Hades and Sheol and, and Tartarus and, you know, we'll, I'll see if I can't even make it a little more concise because you have your cross-references, I'll move us through it maybe a little bit faster. Okay, any questions from today? I hope it was worth it to you. Again, I don't want us to dwell just on, on the horribleness, but I want the reality to be there. I want us to fully understand. And then we also can say to the Lord how much more we love him when we realize what he has saved us from. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Not because we earned it. Not because we deserve it. Nothing but his grace. His love, his mercy. Mercy. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like I. That one I won't ruin for you. <laughs> Okay, any volunteer to close in prayer? Oh, thank you. Father, thank you so much, Lord, of uh, who you are. You are the perfect God. You are the God of compassion, love, and understanding, Father. We thank you uh, for that love, for the compassion, and that mercy that you have upon us each and every day, Father. We thank you for the blessings, Father, that you have given us and deserve them. We thank you for your word. Thank you so much for um, allowing us, Father, to receive what you have given to Russia. I thank you for her. And I pray, Father God, that you continue to pour on her so she can share with us what you have given to her. Thank you for this class. And I pray, Father, for every prayer request that has been written, mentioned, and even <coughs> those, Father, that have not been mentioned. To place before your throne, knowing that you are the perfect God. You are the God that will answer our prayers according to your will. Because your will is always perfect. Because yes. you are our perfect mm -hmm. God. Thank you so much for loving us this much. And thank you so much, Father, for the promise of eternal life with you. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a great way to pass. Thank you, Maria. Lord bless you all. And we'll record the next week. So far, yes, I meant to check, and I do have to go down to the office and ask.